On a hot, muggy afternoon in early July 2002, I happened to be at a local animal shelter in Upper Manhattan where I intended to submit an application to be a volunteer. As I was filling out the paperwork, I noticed a woman dragging a dog who appeared to be a female terrier mix into the shelter. As she pulled the poor creature into the lobby, she was shouting at her in the harshest manner possible. The dog looked bewildered beyond words. I suspected, and rightly so as it turned out, that she was not there to have the animal given shots or an examination, but rather to surrender her to the not-so-tender mercies of the shelter. I looked at the dog closely. I had never seen an animal so despondent, dejected, and resigned to her fate. It was as though she knew the ordeal that lay ahead of her. The shelter's grisly statistics at that time consisted of tens of thousands of unwanted dogs euthanized each year. To return a dog to the shelter after having formally adopted her was equivalent to a death sentence for the animal. I engaged the owner in conversation. She told me that she was conflicted, that she was moving and could not keep her pet. She implored me to save her. I applied for her adoption. Long story short, my application was rejected flat out. I was informed that under no circumstances could the dog be re-released. Reason? The shelter, having evaluated her, had classified her as high status which is a euphemistic way of saying that the management considered the dog overly aggressive and a possible danger to others. Evidence? The dog was seen by personnel biting the bars of her cage in order to get out. What sentient being, whether on four legs or two, I asked, would not act similarly to such confinement? But the management was adamant in its refusal to grant me custody. What to do? It was then that I recalled a conversation that I had with Liz Kruger earlier in the summer when Ms. Kruger was embarking on her first campaign for political office. I believed she was the only hope I had left. To her everlasting credit, Kruger did not have to be asked twice. There was a series of back and forth phone calls between her staff and the shelter. And when I returned there, it was evident that the management had undergone a 180 degree turn, like the difference between day and night. Several days later, Lucky was released from her, from her cage and came bounding happily into the lobby and into my arms. We were together for almost 13 years until November of last year, when cancer, for which she had been treated, overtook her. There were other dogs who were part of my menagerie, helpless souls whom I had rescued while on assignment in various West African countries, and some of whom are still with me. There was Jenna, whose picture you see here, who looked more like a wallaby than a member of the canine species, and whom I found lying under a hedge in downtown Ziggenshore in 2009. Unable to walk because of a tumor on her back paw, which later proved to be cancerous. She lay there suffering in silence. I picked her up and we took a taxi home where I placed her on the cool stone floor of the apartment, gave her water and opened up a can of corned beef and some cheese that she wolfed down enthusiastically. It was probably the first square meal she had ever had. Jenna flew back to the States with me and remained with us for another five years. Taps sounded for her several months before Lucky passed away. In addition, there is Juma, or Friday, a Portuguese water dog from Ziggenshore, as well as Little Flower, who as a pup wandered onto the property in Guinea where I was assigned. There is also Billy Boy from Ghana, cared for by Juliana's family while in country before coming to the U.S. Finally, there is Daffodil, a Mexican greyhound mix and Tina, a refugee from La Boca in Argentina. Once you befriend an animal in a developing country, you know that if you leave them there, they have little to no chance of surviving. It is the pottery barn analogy. If you break it, you own it. 
likewise for strays rescued in poor countries. If you befriend them, you own them, and they own you. To leave them behind is immoral. But I digress. The above mentioned are all good kids and merit the good home that they have. But there was only one lucky. She stood out as the jewel of my empire, primus inter pares, first among equals. She was so stunning that people would stop me in the street to say, what a beautiful dog. And it would not be an exaggeration on my part to say that when Lucky was present, she sucked up all the oxygen in the room. You could not take your eyes off her. Her loyalty was unconditional. Sometimes when I was out of town, I would ask a neighbor, Cheryl, to look in on her and take her for a walk. Then Cheryl would call to say in anguished tones, Lucky's under the bed and she won't come out. In fact, she would not emerge from under the bed until I returned. Her appetite was gargantuan. She could devour an entire loaf of Cuban bread and cheese in a heartbeat. Just one example. The only other dog the Lucky tolerated was Little Joe, whose picture you see, a ridgeback which I brought back from the merciless streets of Ziegenshore in southern Senegal. From the outset, it was monkey see, monkey do. They even slept in the same bed together. During the time we were together, which, as indicated above, spanned almost 13 years, Lucky was my focus, and I have the firm conviction that were it not for Kruger's timely action back in July 2002, Lucky's life would not have been spared. Think of it. She and her staff, responding to a call for help from a constituent she hardly knew, embraced the cause of an innocent animal and saved her life. Her intervention and that of her staff was an act of kindness and compassion, unheralded and accomplished without fanfare. Kruger's willingness to go to bat for a poor and fortunate creature who would not have stood a chance of surviving in a city shelter notorious for its high kill rate is emblematic of her entire career of public service. In an age when cynicism and mistrust of our most revered institutions and politicians are at an all-time high, Liz Kruger is sui generis. That is to say, she is in a class of her own. We need more public servants like her, whose devotion to the common wheel is unfailing.